Ferrari. Ma perché Ferrari? I sedili del Colosseo erano più confortevoli. Ma Ferrari, 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 Ferrari. A new Ferrari is always something to be excited about. A new hatchback Ferrari? <laughs> well, as you saw, I can barely contain my excitement. I love everything about it. Perhaps what I like most about this car is that Ferrari didn't sell out and make an SUV just like everyone else has. They could have easily pulled a Porsche move, which is to make a car in every single segment so long as it's the Ferrari of that segment. Using that logic, they could make the fastest, reddest, most expensive tractor trailer. Ferrari tractor trailer, wouldn't that be dumb? Luckily, Ferrari still makes only the types of cars it always has. Race cars, supercars, sports cars, and GTs. This is the latter, and moreover, it's a wagon. Technically, a shooting brake, which is a two-door wagon. That alone exempts it from any design criticism, at least in my book, but luckily, it's pretty great looking anyway. It's the replacement for the FF, and it keeps the same basic shape, but it loses that car's stoned anime character front end and single taillights. And of course, it gets an entirely new badge, the GTC4 Lusso. The GTC name harks back to the cars that Enzo Ferrari drove back in the day. Four refers to the number of seats this has. Four actual human being adult sized seats, all of which are rock hard and miserably uncomfortable. Now, seat comfort tends to be a very subjective thing. However, everyone who's gotten in this car has complained about the seats immediately, including our crew members, who are all like 20 and 30. Luis, comfy? Oye, hermano, este asiento está de madre, como un cuarto de tortura. Inglés, por favor? My worst and nightmare. See? However, the last part of this Ferrari's name is Luso, meaning luxury, and the cabin certainly delivers that. Everything is covered in beautiful leather and the design is restrained Italy at its best. The next generation steering wheel still contains almost all secondary controls. The biggest step forward is, and I hate to say it, the big touchscreen infotainment system. It's got great graphics, it's fairly easy to use, and it experiences precisely as many bugs and glitches as you'd expect from Italian software. The front passenger information screen on the right is now touch sensitive and it can display music, navigation, chassis, or performance information. It is so cool. about the best part of the whole car, which is the V12 under the hood. 13 and a half to one compression, 8,200 RPM, big bore, short stroke, it is a masterpiece. There's a huge mystique that surrounds the V12 engine and the Ferrari V12 in particular. And I think it's because of the dichotomy between how smooth it delivers the power and how insane it sounds outside. However, despite all of that screaming engine and this Formula One looking steering wheel, this is not a sports car. And let me explain why. If you're in a 488 and you want to upshift, by the time your grubby little fingers touch the shift paddle, transmission's already in the next gear. Not the case here. It's quick-ish, but it's really smooth. It's like a torque converter automatic. And the 95-year-old people who buy this car will love that. They'll love the enormous speedometer display. And this ride is so smooth, made possible by that wheelbase and MR dampers. They'll also love that it's 
really quiet in here. It has dual pane windows and I can see the mountains through the big glass sunroof. All that stuff is heavy. This is not a 3,000 pound sports car. This is a 4,500 pound bruiser. And since Ferrari doesn't have to obsess over weight in this car, they can do things like the door handle. Bear with me, I know it sounds stupid, but you're not gonna believe this. Might be the best part of the car. Okay, when you grab the door handle, it's cold, it's actual metal, and you pull up, the window goes down, and you're met with like 30 times the resistance you'd ever feel in any normal door handle, and then, oh, this perfect dunk, it opens. The door handle feels so good you could buy this car just for that reason alone. And speaking of things that are heavy, this car has all-wheel drive, just like the FF did, and that's really interesting to tech geeks like me. Why? Because the entire engine is behind the front axle line, and the transmission is at the back. If you want to send power to the front wheels, you have to take it from the back of the transmission and send it all the way back forward past the engine. And to do that, well, you got to raise the engine up like the Nissan GTR does, and you have a hood line like an F-150 pickup truck. That would never do for Ferrari. So Ferrari did something that no one else has ever done, ever, I think. Ferrari installed a second transmission, powering just the front wheels it's bolted to the front of the engine. This two-speed automatic chooses its gear based on what the seven-speed outback is doing. It can send more than half of the engine's power to both or either of the front wheels, performing real torque vectoring. The only drawback to this lightweight, ingenious system is that it's in-op once you're past redline and fourth gear. However, if you're spinning the tires over 135 miles an hour, you don't need all-wheel drive. You need a good estate attorney. This four-wheel drive system is literally called four-wheel drive evolution because it's an evolution of the four-wheel drive system that was in the FF. It adds rear wheel steering, making one more input into Ferrari's chassis control computer. This is one of the things Ferrari does better than any other company. As you're driving along, that computer is making a real-time 3D physics model of the car and the road and everything that's happening. It receives input and more importantly, control over the engine, the transmission, the limited slip differential out back, the all-wheel drive system and its torque vectoring, the magnetorheological shocks, the brakes, and now rear wheel steering. The system is predictive, meaning because it's building that model, it doesn't have to wait until something gets screwed up. It fixes the problem before it even starts. And it doesn't have to do that with stupid things like cutting power or dragging the brake. It can change other things like tightening the diff or adjusting the shocks or turning the rear wheels. The computer doesn't have control over the front wheels because this car doesn't have electric power steering, thank God. And you'd think because it's hydraulically assisted, I would love this steering, and I don't. That has to do with the rear wheel steering. When you get on the gas in the middle of a corner, Ferrari actively turns the wheels to the outside to let the engine's power help turn the back of the car. It's probably faster, but it's really disconcerting because it feels like you're starting to slide, even if you're not. Just throwing you sideways is just so out of character with the rest of the grand touring nature of this car. It just comes out of nowhere. Because again, this isn't a sports car. The GTC4 is, when it's not throwing itself sideways, a luxury car. This is the kind of car that you'd want to drive every day to work, 200 miles at 150 miles an hour, because it's so quiet and composed and comfortable in every way except for these seats. It isn't just special by virtue of it wearing a Ferrari badge or having a V12 or being a 680 horsepower station wagon with two transmissions, four wheel drive, and the ability to cross continents at 208 miles an hour. With the exception of hard seats and overzealous rear wheel steering, this Luso is a perfect mixture of Ferrari GT tradition and genuine usability. Or, as they'd say in the home country, mi fa male la schiena a causa dei posti disgraziati. <laughs>